Dan, welcome to Boulder. Hi, thanks. It's nice to be here. <laughs> what is your relationship to Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, at this moment? At this moment, I am visiting six weeks ahead of moving here. So the moving here is it's um, a for sure thing. Yeah, basically. There's nothing stopping me except myself, and I don't think I'm going to change my mind. Mm. Your particular job is remote? Not at the moment, but um, I've spoken to my company about it, and they've given me permission to start working remote. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. And, and you're, in, you're in Brooklyn now? I live in Brooklyn, and I work in Manhattan. Okay. And what is it about this move that uh, is, is enticing you? I've been ready to get the fuck out of New York for a long time. Yeah. And for years, I was postponing it because I didn't know where to go. I didn't have a particular reason. I didn't have any social networks waiting for me anywhere else. So it was like, okay, I could pack up my whole life and move to some other arbitrary location that I hope has something for me. But there was no, you know, center of gravity there. Um, but just last year, I met a couple of really great friends on a retreat in Costa Rica. And they invited me to come visit them after the retreat. And I did. Mm. and kind of fell in love with Boulder. So mm -hmm. This is just a really lovely place. It has a really good energy. It's absolutely stunning mm -hmm. views. And um, it just feels more congruent to my my current perspective. Mm. Mm -hmm. And what was the retreat that you met these people in? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, the name of the retreat was Apotheosis. It was organized by the team from highexistence.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, we spent a week in the Costa Rican jungle doing all kinds of spiritual development work. So mixed modalities. There was a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation, a lot of sort of coaching. And um, I don't know what to call them other than sort of non-dogmatic stuff. Um, and the, uh, the sort of central event was uh, two ayahuasca ceremonies. Mm. Um, so that was, you know something of a spiritual pilgrimage for me and really kind of like helped me push past the, the ledge I was struggling to climb up over. Mm -hmm. um, the visual metaphor is something like, you know, you're climbing up a hill and at the crest of the hill is like an overhang. Mm -hmm. And to get over the crest takes one final exertion. It's a little bit harder than the rest of the climb up. Mm -hmm. But once you get there, you're at a new level. Mm. So that's sort of what I felt like that retreat was about for me. Mm. How would you describe the new level? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess the way I think of levels is something like the things that you do naturally and easily that you don't have to think about, very woo way, like you know, effortless action, um, is how you know where your level is. So if you couldn't do those things before, that was because you were at a lower level. Uh -huh. When you level up, the stuff that used to feel hard, like you feel drained and you felt uncertain that you could even do it at all, at the higher level, you just do it without thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. And what, what are some of those things in your, in your life? So one of the reasons why we're sitting down having this conversation is because um, I have been exposed to your work on Twitter <laughs> and I, some people laugh when I like when I know I, when I call tweets a body of work or work just generally, but well, like, I call this the shit post sutra. The shit post sutra. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I do view it as a body of work. Amazing. Okay, yeah. good. Um, and you have a uh, there. There's like this really dynamic intersection and expression that you bring to Twitter that. The, I mean, the two themes that, that, that came up for me in inviting you is Buddhism broadly and then psychedelics sure. on, on the other side. And yeah. I feel like in your life, they sort of intersect in kind of a natural or... Yeah, they really do. Way. They've always gone together for me. Um, I discovered psychedelics when I was about 19 years old, um, spent a couple of years exploring them pretty intensely, and then put them down for 10 years. Mm. And came back um, about about four years ago, after a ten year break, and have once again sort of dived into the numinous pool of psychedelic 
wisdom or however you want to phrase it. Mm. Um, and this time around, I also started spiritual practice at the same time, coming into that from a kind of also a multimodal perspective where um, Dharma practice and Buddhism were interesting to me and I found them valuable to study and learn from. Um, but I never, you know, signed up at a temple. I didn't, you know, I didn't do it in a traditional way. I was just sort of self-directed. Um, but that was also like not the only thing I was doing. I was exploring all kinds of stuff. So like I had a series of conversations with a uh, Western voodoo priest, for example, which is a direction I decided not to go in because it just didn't feel like a match. But I was very interested in exploring and seeing what was out there. And what I've eventually sort of converged upon is um, trying to find the intersection of the Western style of Dharma practice, which is very distinct from traditional Eastern forms. Maybe that's something we can, we can dive into a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and to see how we can use psychedelics in that context to augment the practices. And also for people who come from a psychedelic background and have relatively little engagement with the Dharma, to communicate to them in a skillful way the means through which their experience can be interpreted and integrated. Because I think Buddhism has a really wonderful toolkit for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why this is the direction I want to start in, but I've been thinking a lot about um, the shadow aspects of various psychedelic and spiritual communities. Sure. And um, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, um, like, what are some of the, what are the more kind of shadowy elements of the intersection of these particular two modalities? Okay. Um, a lot of this is just sort of my commentary because I have fortunately not had to directly experience much of this shadow stuff. Um, or rather, I should say I did my own shadow work, and I did it in in private with some very compassionate guides. It didn't play out socially. Mm. Um, but I think that a lot of that shadow stuff does play out socially, especially when people are getting into this stuff um, through a social context originally where they actually haven't done their personal shadow work first. And they're bringing that into community without really understanding what they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like airing dirty laundry without even knowing what you're doing. And that creates a lot of circumstances where I think people have problems with getting a grip on their sexuality or getting a grip on their appetites or things like that. And we can sort of run away from them. Um, there are all kinds of failure modes for this that are really well documented. One of the most famous ones is spiritual bypassing, where you just pretend you're so holy that you don't have to worry about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Another one is what I would call dark enlightenment, where you actually are gaining a lot of the benefits of the practice, except you're just not integrating them in an ethical framework. So mm -hmm. you think you can like step outside of society's rules because you see through how, how fake all of this stuff is. But then you just become like, a tornado moving through a trailer park. Like you can't just wantonly destroy everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't matter if you actually see through the veil, like you're, you're still in the world. You still have to be responsible to the people you contact. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the shadow side of the psychedelic community has come out a lot in the last couple of years. There's a lot of fallout from what started as the broader cultural sort of me too movement and then just a lot of call-outs of people in the psychedelic community who had not behaved very well with respect to their sexual appetites. Mm. I don't even want to get into the specifics of it. I just want to say, like, everyone who is working with medicine like this should be aware of the problems of suggestibility when you put someone in that mm -hmm. state. And there's really a sacred duty we have to make sure that you aren't even accidentally or subconsciously taking advantage of them. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest recurring pattern that I've seen is an older and more established person in the community will have access to things like space and um, business opportunities and community clout and that kind of stuff. These are like resources that younger and hungrier people want access to. Mm -hmm. And the really common situation where things go badly is a younger and more vulnerable person especially a woman, mm -hmm. will do things that they don't want to. 
because they think that they're going to get something they do want out of it. And then their ability to believe that they did the right thing is contingent on them getting what they wanted. And if they don't get what they wanted, they have to deal with the regret. And it feels like shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they gave away their agency and their power. They let someone do something with or to them that they might have wanted to go differently or possibly not at all. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get the outcome they expected or hoped for. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't have because they didn't really do it the right way. Um, but, you know, the the older and more established people ought to be responsible for understanding that dynamic. They do have to be aware of power imbalances and asymmetries when you're dealing with people like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, man, I just like, I don't know. I, I, I have this like feeling of dread right now. Why? I don't know. It's just like, I'm trying to figure out what it's about. Like, I've just been kind of in like an off mood this morning. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know exactly what it's about, but, but hearing, hearing you mention those things is just, um, mm, I don't know. Maybe I'm just reflecting on moments in, in my own life where I've witnessed things like this happening and I don't know, there's some sadness there. I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And one of the things I think the community in both the Buddhist communities that I've interacted with, and especially the psychedelic communities, which are newer and wilder and have less sort of ritual to hold space for these kind of emotions, they just don't know how to get people through this grieving process that happens when mm. when there was a bad outcome, which can range anything from like, you know, um, the bad outcomes are, are as mild as um, I didn't get the internship I wanted and as severe as I got raped. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to like put those all on the same level. Obviously, some things are worse than others. But they really do kind of lead to the same process, which is you have to go through these stages of mourning and grieving, like you know, denial, rage, and then eventually acceptance. Um, and it really has to be done socially. I think one of the biggest problems that comes up is people feel ashamed of themselves and don't know who they can go to. And then by the time this stuff does start to come out, it's explosive. It's been built up like a pressure vessel and the lid pops off and it's all anger and rage and accusation. And that's just not how anything gets resolved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you had to say goodbye to any communities that have imploded before? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to deliberately be vague because yeah. it, it doesn't help anyone to, you know, name and shame. Totally. Um, but I will say that, you know, there was a person I was working with who was very close to me who was accused of misbehavior um, when... I spoke with him about the accusations. He told me what had happened. And it's very clear from from that that some of the accusations were overblown and some of the accusations were not. Mm -hmm. And it was very painful for me to have to accept that this this person had been ejected from the community that they were an important part of and that I had been leveraging, to be perfectly honest. This person was very well-connected. And it was to my advantage to be able to drop their name and get invited to things because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wasn't able to do that anymore, which was fine. You know, like one of the things I think ends up being really important is having these resilient social networks that can, Mm -hmm. that can heal after a hole has been punched in them. Um, But one of the more painful parts of that was seeing how the rest of the community reacted to them where there was no compassion for that person, even though they had misbehaved. The severity of the misbehavior was overblown. Mm -hmm. And they were treated as if they were, you know, like a violent criminal menace, which is not the case at all. Mm. Um, And it hasn't really even healed over yet. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the community is still torn asunder because of it. And I don't see it. I don't really see a good path forward. I think that people were interested in revenge and sort of petty, 
payback stuff instead of actually figuring out how to move forward. What do you think that's about? That that impulse to to treat immaturity. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's immaturity. Um, I think that on some level you can get a little bit of an adrenaline rush or like a dopamine hit from like the vicarious suffering of others. It's mm-hmm. pretty dark stuff. But we have to acknowledge that this is just a human impulse and on some level everyone experiences Schadenfreude even if it's even if it's, if it's over nothing, like sometimes when I'm watching my friends play Super Smash Brothers and somebody gets their ass kicked, I'm just like, fuck you, man. <laughs> it's funny. It's just mm-hmm. funny. Um, and you can get away with it when the stakes are that low. Yeah. Um, but when the stakes are higher, you really do have to grow up and, you know, handle yourself like an adult, which actually means you have compassion on both sides. Even the person who did misbehave deserves your compassion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about the like the redemption paths or or lack thereof that people have access to in in this culture. Like there's a especially if you're if you're a big public figure, there's there is um making amends in in private that's going to happen with mm-hmm. people that you're legitimately close to. But then there's this more performative aspect too where you kind of have to um, and I don't know that at the path is as clear as it used to be anymore of like the, the redemption tour. Yeah. You know, like the, I think that's good though. I think that when the redemption tour is prefabricated and you just go to your publicity agent and say, okay, what next? Right. Then it's fake. Right. Like you really do have to figure it out on your own. Yeah. There's something that, that there's something that's kind of scary with that uncertainty, Mm -hmm. but, but it's, but it also is more authentic too. Yeah. For real. Yeah. I think that the word you use was scary. That's a really good word. Um, I think one of the biggest problems that people have in our culture, America in particular, the West in general, and maybe globally, is we we don't honor fear. Mm-hmm. We We try to look away from it. We try to sweep it under the rug. We try to pretend it's not there. Mm-hmm. We don't ever want to feel afraid unless we're debasing the fear by making an entertainment Mm. and there's a lot of fear pornography out there which ranges from you know fear-mongering news broadcasts where they want you to get all worked up about the economy or all worked up about north korean missiles or whatever Mm -hmm. or maybe it's actual entertainment products where it's a scary movie with like serial killers and murderers and stuff in it um but the authentic experience of fear when it's really your ass on the line and what you're afraid of is profound loss, mm-hmm. whether that's loss of social status or loss of life or any other thing that you value. That's a real emotion. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the hardest emotions to deal with. And because it's so powerful, it really deserves to be honored and not forgotten, ignored, debased, or made pornographic. Mm. What does that look or feel like to you, honoring fear? <laughs> um I think that there's a certain type of psychedelic experience that is sometimes called a bad or a challenging trip Uh that is what really happens when the medicine decides that you need to honor fear. Yeah. And I think it's one of the most profound growth experiences I've ever had. And it's, I'm going to get myself in trouble saying this, but fuck it. Um, Sometimes people need a bad trip. Yeah. And I think that a lot of psychedelic guides know this and know better than to speak about it because you can't tell a client, I want to scare the shit out of you. I want to inflict mortal terror upon you. And on the other side of that, you will feel like the worst you've ever felt in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because I'm going to hold you and you're not going to die really, but you're going to feel like you might have. And you're going to come out of it on the other side, feeling more alive than you ever did before. Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, the way out is through and people don't want to see that. They want to, you know, they want to, they want to go around it. They want, they want an easy path or, or a bridge that somebody else built. But, you know, no, there isn't one. You go into that chasm yourself um, and it's yours. Everyone has one. Mm-hmm. So I think honoring fear means being willing to have a bad trip in a psychedelic experience and maybe even sometimes 
arranging your set and setting so that you're in you're inviting one mm-hmm. um i mean terence mckenna was very famous for his you know uh exhortation is it five dried grams in the silent darkness all by yourself right um he wasn't wrong mm-hmm. he wasn't wrong it's intense and you know sometimes you you might balk at the thought of it you might you might really recoil from it because it's fear that's what fear does to you it would be it wouldn't be fear if it was too easy to look at right Mm -hmm. that's how you know you're dealing with the real thing um i'm remembering a story alan badiner told me last time i went to an event that he was speaking at and he said he had visited terrence at the hawaii house when he was there and terrence just handed him a potion which was I guess a homebrew of ayahuasca or something like that. And he didn't give him any coaching for it. He just said, drink up and I'll come find you in the morning. <laughs> and he did. And he was scared shitless all night long. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he said, you know, this must've been 25 years ago. And he was still, you know, barely able to talk about it without his hands trembling. Um, that's how powerful it was. And I'm sure that, like, while he was in that, he he was, you know, really not happy about it. But the way that he tells the story now made it very, very clear to me that that was one of the most important things that ever happened to him. Mm. That being able to come to terms with the loss of control, the need to accept everything that happens to you as it's happening without trying to pull away from it or keep it out Mm. right okay so i'm i'm finding a thread for some sort of um explanatory thread for where the sean and frodo sometimes comes from yeah and i think it's when people massively fail in public there's there's a lot of risk that's associated with that Mm -hmm. and a lot of fear yeah so so when people are are putting themselves out there and failing on a massive scale whether it's whether it's through their own personal shadow showing itself or you know or 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 however it shows up it, there's like they're confronting their fear in some uh grand or public way and that schadenfreude that comes online when people see that, it can sometimes be like, oh, like that person is fa- that that person failed, so therefore I can feel okay about not putting myself out there. Yes, it's like an excuse to not do something scary. Yes, yes, right. that's exactly what it is. Yeah, I think that's a big element of it. I think that's one of the reasons why the schadenfreude feels satisfying. But I think another reason for it is monkey mind, that we're social primates and one of the really like deeply embedded cognitive traits of social primates is constantly tracking social status pecking order yeah and actually feeling a rush at the prospect of someone getting taken down a peg because it creates an opening for you right right yeah yeah and that's dark stuff that's this is like what we need to wake up from this is just the ground that we arise from yeah. and it's useful. Like we, we are this way because we needed to be this way. Um, it's not an accident and it serves a utilitarian function of allowing us to survive or thrive in primate social groups, but it also pathologizes us so that we can get into this mode where we forget that that's what we're doing. And we put so many like layers of wallpaper on, on top of it that we don't even see the foundation of it anymore. Mm-hmm. We're, we're pretending that like there are social reasons for it that justify and excuse it. But all of that stuff is made up that mm-hmm. at, at the bottom, it's all just like monkeys flinging shit at each other. Mm-hmm. And we have to just be real about that. There are times when every single person is going to feel like, they're going to do something really perverse because their monkey mind is acting up. Um, they're going to hurt somebody because they can get away with it. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, that's what that kind of monkey mind stuff looks like. 
and you know don't do it <laughs> um it's easy to say that mm-hmm. it's very hard to point to it in the moment it's happening mm-hmm. that's what requires the the development of these sort of contemplative skills so you can get ahead of that a little bit and see it more clearly mm-hmm. so rather than ask more um abstract questions about buddhist practice the thing i want to ask you is like what are so what are some of the questions that you're grappling with in, in your own personal practice right now? Sure. Um, in my own personal practice right now, I'm sort of transitioning the style of my practice from being very deconstructive to being very constructive. Nice. Yeah. Um, this, this sort of aligns with the path of Buddhist Tantra, yeah. where you first begin by doing this sort of sutrayana style of practice where you're deconstructing your egoic self you're arriving at the phenomenal experience that buddhists call shunyata emptiness Mm -hmm. and you're experiencing firsthand these important markers of i guess i would call it a sort of kensho a glimpse of enlightenment um, which is no self anatta and impermanence anicca and deeply accepting the reality of karma and the suffering it causes, dukkha. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's just Buddhist doctrine. I mean, you asked me not to answer abstractly. Here's here's the real thing. Um, The deconstructive period with me was like four intensive years of um, talk therapy, psychedelic-assisted therapy, MDMA-assisted therapy, um, spiritual retreat practice, ayahuasca ceremony, shadow work, just any like you know kitchen sink approach try everything Mm -hmm. and basically it worked Mm. um i was really able to sort of get to the core of a lot of the things that had been holding me back and keeping me trapped in a very unhappy world and kind of broke out of it that's what i was talking about earlier with that like one last push to get to the ledge Mm -hmm. um so the things that were hard for me before that were effortless now were like relaxing letting go of neurotic ruminations, Mm -hmm. not taking myself so seriously, Mm -hmm. right? That was really hard for me before. And I came across to people as really dire and really worried and anxious. Mm. Um, And it was really hard for me to be playful and light. Mm -hmm. And that's coming a lot easier now. I just don't worry as much, which is not to say I don't take things seriously. I take myself seriously. I just don't want everyone else to take me seriously. (laughs) (laughs) What's the distinction there? Um, When I say I take myself seriously, I mean that I believe in the importance of my own work, the stuff that I do on and for myself, and the way that I can give back, the way that I can work in the world, make myself available to others and serve. Mm -hmm. Um, Figuring out how to serve the world is very difficult. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I have my talents and I have my proclivities and I have my desires too. And finding alignment between all of that, I think is what service ought to look like. Um, And that's sort of where I'm at now. That's this construction phase, which is moving into a more Vajrayana or tantric style of practice where it says, okay, now that you know that you don't have to be as you were, that it wasn't essential, that it was just circumstances and conditioning, you can build from that. Mm-hmm. You've found the ground. So now lay a foundation. Mm. And I'm really just moving into that phase right now. Um, but I feel very hopeful about it. It gives me a lot of positivity for the future. And, you know, moving to Boulder is one of the things that aligns with it. Finding community here, finding people that resonate with me and who have resources and networks that i can utilize and also contribute to Mm -hmm. i think that the 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 bi-directionality of that is super important yeah and just to sort of circle back to your earlier question about failure modes i think that one of the major causes of failure modes is asymmetry in those networks they're not bi-directional that there are authority figures telling people what to do and the people underneath those authority figures have to just do as they're told they can't express themselves and they can't give back in their authentic selves Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah 
that's the um uh, guru guru mode is like people are always going to fall into uh, i mean i don't know about always but people people will get will get stuck in these guru traps these like psychologically abusive relationships but we also like the modern mind is also much more skeptical t- yes. to that yes. dynamic now right and yet and yet right um as as i've read about the history of these dozens of guru scandals that's just in buddhism alone every religious group has dozens of guru scandals mm-hmm. um it's it's really highlighted something for me which is a lot of people want the work to be done for them by an authority figure mm-hmm. they want a clear path they want instructions they want to follow the instructions and be told that they did it right and get a gold star or check mark or an a plus and to use that method of social reinforcement for them to, to consider themselves to be doing good and it doesn't work it sets them up for abuse it allows them to give away their power. My perspective is that everyone is their own authority. We are all gurus to ourselves and only ourselves. The way that you can interact with another person is through mutual exchange as friends, as peers. And I think that that's really what this sort of fourth turning of the Dharma wheel is going to produce. Um, I've seen the term meta Dharma used to describe that and I'm sympathetic to it. I like the label. And the reason I like that label is because it orients Dharma practice around the exchanges Mm -hmm. instead of the hierarchies. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The, um, what is the, like the, the the future guru is the Sangha. That was Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh said the next Buddha will be a Sangha. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but I like that as an idea. <laughs> it's very glib. <laughs> yeah. And this is my criticism of famous Buddhists, or Thich Nhat Hanh is a good example. The Dalai Lama is the most famous one. They do perform. They have a character that they play. Yeah. And one of the things that that character does is they produce these fortune cookie quotations mm-hmm. because they're very memorable. Like, you can put it on a bumper sticker. And, okay, good. Like, it's good marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, we should not lose the forest for the trees here. Like, mm-hmm. It's just marketing. That That's not the Dharma. That's just marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, so when he says the next Buddha will be a Sangha, okay, like what does that really mean? The next Buddha, okay, who's the next Buddha? Um, well, we are all enlightened beings on some level at various stages of realization. So the next Buddha could be any or all of us and the next Buddha will be a Sangha, maybe it should be phrased shall be a Sangha, mm. right? Because it's not speculative, it's imperative. Mm. Um, we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. And the more we wake up and see the state of the world and see the consequences of disconnection and atomization, the more obvious that becomes. We are all in this together. Um, there is no enlightenment for anyone unless everyone does it. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're doing it by yourself, then, well, congratulations, you found some state of being that feels really good and you're very carefree and blessed and you can accept absolutely anything that happens to you without breaking a sweat and cool, go float through your life. That's awesome. Um, On the other hand, what if you turned away from that, marched back into the city and figured out the best way to tell everyone else that they had to start their path to? Mm. That's hard to do. (laughs) That is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Like, who the hell are you to do it? Mm -hmm. Um, Or who the hell am I to do it? Mm -hmm. It it gets into this territory where you're dealing with, you know, first of all, how arrogant it is to pretend that you can tell anybody else what to do. Um, But you do have to have that kind of confidence in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think is actually one of the major failure modes of Western Buddhism as it has been received. Um, There has been a too strong emphasis on the paving over of the self, flattening of people's individuality. And the West is an individualistic culture. So maybe that happens by trying to square peg East Asian Buddhism into the 
round hole of Western society. And it, it creates mismatch or incongruence. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a mistake. Actually, Westerners are individualistic and actually Westerners are egotistical and a bit narcissistic too. Mm-hmm. So like, how do you transform egotism and narcissism into something much more pro-social? I don't think you can actually succeed in that transformation unless you allow people to cultivate healthy egos. You should feel confident. You should have some swagger. You should, you know, fuck yeah, I'm enlightened. I'm awesome. Mm. You want to work with me because I'm really good. Every, you know, everyone who's around me gets better, mm-hmm. right? You should be able to feel that way about yourself without it also transforming into, and everyone who's around me gives me what I want and makes me feel good about myself. Mm-hmm. Those are different things. Yeah. Yeah, how do you be uh, how do you be someone that has that swagger and confidence, but does not surround yourself with yes men? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm aware that it's a failure mode. I've seen it before. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. My first impulse is like letting the people in your inner circle know that it's um, somehow communicate that it, it is safe to. Uh, have hard conversations. Right. Yeah. I think that's super important. And hard conversations are hard. Um, yeah. One of the, one of the things that I've seen people do is they start to have a hard conversation and somebody gets triggered and it transform from transforms from a hard conversation into accusation or a sort of struggle session. Mm-hmm. And that should never be allowed to happen. Mm-hmm. Be allowed to happen. Like it's the issue of permission, like allowed by whom, Right. Um, one of the things that I think might help in getting over the narcissism problem is the idea of sovereignty, um, where individual people should understand that they are responsible for their own lives. Mm-hmm. And claiming sovereignty is, you know, radical self-acceptance. Say, I am this. And because I am this, I'm going to do what this does. But no one can tell you what that is. You have to figure it out for yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm. Hmm. I kind of want to double click on that the swagger piece yeah, and let's go. It, it actually is directly related to this more constructive spiritual phase that you find yourself mm-hmm. moving into it's like what do you want to create right um, which also relates to there was this thread on twitter that I pointed to, it, it was it was in in response to um, fashion and sort of like self expression. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, like how how do you how do you express yourself in a like full embodied playful way without the narcissism? <laughs> yeah, I mean that. I'm gonna I'm just gonna have to give you an incomplete answer here because it's yeah. like work in progress. Um, the Twitter thread that you're referring to, I think, was um, a, another person had asked something like, how do you want to see yourself? Or what image do you want to project into the world? Yeah. Or something like that. And I, I said, I want to be seen as a very, very stylish, put together, distinctive and iconic man. Mm. Yeah. And, I, and then I said, and I don't think I'm there yet but I'm working on it and I think I'm getting better at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So that's what I'm thinking of is like how to be stylish and put together and iconic so that when, like if somebody could see just a silhouette of you, they would know it was you. They wouldn't even have to see your face. Yeah. And I like part of it is role modeling, right? Like um, David Bowie. Yeah. Right. One of the most astonishingly talented male glam icons yeah. that that I can think of. Um, and he did it in a very idiosyncratic way. There's nobody like him. Right. Um, he's got imitators. He's got people that he inspired. But he's a self-created person, an icon. Yeah. And you can't buy that off the rack at a store. Yeah. Um, so when I think about how to do it for myself, it's like, the full spectrum. How do I want my body to look? What kind of clothes do I want to wear? How do I want to smell? How do I want to interact with people? What, what effect should my voice have on people? That kind of stuff. Um, so it's really, it's everything. And you know, like 
just last year, I started just changing my relationship to clothing, uh-huh. where I'd spent most of my life very frustrated with clothing, found the shopping experience to be a bad one. It felt sort of humiliating. Uh-huh. Um, I was very uncomfortable with my body. This is an audio interview, so people can't see me, but I'm holding my slightly chubby belly right now. <laughs> um, and f- I felt a lot of shame over it, body shame. Uh-huh. And I had to get over that. It's not easy to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure I'm entirely over it yet. Yeah, how do you get over it? Yeah, right. Um, I mean, some of it is is you need positive reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very easy to find negative reinforcement over your body in this culture. Mm-hmm. Um, We're very superficial and we have a lot of uh, media imagery that shows people looking unrealistically beautiful, which can be because these are genetic lottery winners who look a way that you will never look in your own body or because it's literally artifice. It's, you Mm -hmm. know, Photoshop um, where no, there's no human who looks like that. It's actually a constructed image. Mm -hmm. Um, They're like, they're, they're like platonic forms. Right. Right. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Literally statuesque. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things was just sort of dropping that. I, I was never too deeply sucked into that. So my own particular issues were more around the way I would feel humiliated when I would try to go clothes shopping, not be able to find any clothes that felt good on my body. The ones that looked good on me were very uncomfortable to wear. And the ones that were comfortable to wear looked bad on me. Hmm. Um, and that led to a lot of years of, and yeah, maybe I made the wrong decision. I should have bought the uncomfortable ones. Instead, I bought the ugly ones. Mm. So I just looked like shit. I was constantly, you know, walking around in uh, clothes that were half a size too big and baggy and not draping well. Um, made me look even chubbier than I actually am. Mm-hmm. Um, another part of it was not having a clear grapple on my own masculine image. Mm-hmm. Which is to say, I'm not really good at conforming to conventional masculinity. I, I would label my gender as lunar male, hmm. whatever the hell that means. Mm-hmm. Interpret it as you want. Yeah. Um, and I had to just own that. I really did. So I started experimenting with it and sort of glamming it up a little bit. I started painting my nails, for example. Mm-hmm. And discovered that I really liked it. It made me feel pretty. Mm. And I do mean pretty. I don't mean handsome or bold. I mean pretty. Mm -hmm. And I had to get over the cultural baggage of men should not feel pretty. Mm -hmm. But no, actually, I do like feeling pretty. I like like that feeling of being sort of delicate and, you know, glamorous. Yeah. Which is very feminine, but that's okay. Well, there there is something about that, like, trad masculinity that feels like it's, um, they're like, you should be this way. Like, come into this cage with me. Yeah. Like the the like here are the appropriate bounds of like what it means to express yourself in a masculine way. And I I find that the more um like vehement people are in defending the way that they express themselves, the more trapped that they actually feel. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um so I had never gotten sucked into that very narrow cage of traditional masculine expression. I was like stuck on the outside of that looking at it as if it was the only good way to look. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that was what I had to get rid of. So just turn away from, from that image. Say, I'm, I'm not trying to look like that. I'm not trying to look like Brad Pitt or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. traditionally attractive male icon you can think of. Um, and then, I mean, of course, the positive reinforcement stuff, I think, has to be reemphasized. What I really, really needed to hear from people is that when I would express myself in the way that I wanted to that felt comfortable to me that other people liked it too Mm. and had to be in the right environment for that Mm -hmm. um so finding myself in social groups and communities that were more accepting of the way that I felt comfortable being and what that means is like hanging out with a lot of queer people for me Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is universal experience I'm saying like sort of coming out a little bit has been really transformative for me. Mm. Um, and again, it's like interpret that as you will. Mm-hmm. Whatever whatever level of queerness I am is a work in progress. Mm. I, I try not to self-label or, or plant a flag in any specific identity. Mm-hmm. 
all I'm all I'm saying is the more I express myself, the kind of weirder and further from the mainstream it gets. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like uh queerness as unfolding process. Yeah. Cool. I like yeah. that. Yeah. And and uh, as like a as a just sort of generally philosophy general philosophy, I think that reflects the way that the world actually is pretty accurately. I think so too. Yeah. Um, what we see in nature is variety. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever you find a monoculture, think there was an intervention here. Mm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. We've had this. We've had this conversation sort of off the record before, just about like. Um, Mm. Um, about like secret society. <laughs> yeah. Like um, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out like where where it fits in. Um. Uh. Like. C- okay, communities that aren't part of the larger monoculture. Mm-hmm. The well, a the importance of having places where those are allowed to exist and thrive. Yeah. But b also like how to interface with the monoculture right what what aspects of that expression need to be kept secret that's a great question i don't think i have a good answer for it Mm. um i think that everyone should be worldly enough to understand the consequences of being on the wrong side of a rage mob Mm. um we have a mass scale society with a very strongly socially enforced mainstream culture. The nice thing about America in 2020 is that it's really mostly social enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, have not seen in my lifetime the level of violence that my ancestors experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, my ancestors were Ashkenazi Jewish. They came from Eastern Europe. So mm-hmm. they got the worst of it, the worst possible. Mm-hmm. Um, but lesser versions of that show up all over the place where it's very, very easy for mass societies to make scapegoats and blame them for everything. Um, So a group that's inherently out of the mainstream for whatever reason will have to be very careful about not being too obvious of a target for scapegoating. And like that sucks, right? This, This is just a harsh reality. I really wish the world wasn't like this, but we have to be savvy to it. We really do need to understand that like a certain amount of, of deliberate stealth and taking care to know when, where, and how hard to push boundaries is necessary. Mm -hmm. If you do it wrong, you end up crucified. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, I, I think that because the mainstream culture can be so kind of oppressive with its conformity, you're generally not free to act and you're not free to do that kind of personal development that's necessary as part of the waking up process. I think that really the best containers for this process are small, subcultural, and secretive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's funny to say it, Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, here we go. This is an active endorsement of um, shadowy cabals. (laughs) Fuck yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge supporter of that. Yeah, right. And, and working with psychedelics, it actually trains you to, especially in a context where they're not legal. So you, you have to figure out what to say and who to say it to. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And in an era where there's like mass surveillance and generations coming up who don't really have the same relationship to privacy that earlier generations used to have. It's like, how do you teach that? How do you teach what to keep? If you're a, if you're a kid who was raised on the internet with a with a smartphone in your hand since you were five years old, yeah, like maybe part of their process is learning how to establish personal boundaries that they never learned in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'd be curious to I'd be curious to hear or, or, or to see what what sorts of those um, like burgeoning online subcultures are happening in private yeah. Slack groups or discords or something right well i mean this is like the frequently remarked on real secret of using twitter um you have the broadcast aspect of the platform which is really good for finding people but when you want to go deep and get to know them you first you switch to a direct message and then you eventually migrate to a slack or a discord or something Mm -hmm. this is how it actually works it's like 
I like I like the image of the mycelial network where mm. the above ground part, the fruiting body's mushroom, pops up at the right opportunity to distribute the spores and you know get the culture spread far and wide. But what's really happening, the actual body of the organism is underground. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's your relationship with Twitter and anonymity? You have an you have a avatar. I do. You you um you are not interested in being doxxed. <laughs> right. Um I consider my Twitter identity to be semi-private. Uh -huh. Um I use my first name. Dan is actually my first name. Uh -huh. Um for people who have gone to the effort to get to know me, they can learn my last name and other details about my life. It's not supposed to be a disposable or throwaway identity. It is a long-term stable identity. I just choose not to reveal my full socially sanctioned identity with my full name and my place of work and mm -hmm. all that. And it's because of the secretiveness. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a calibrated level of secrecy where it's like a semi-permeable membrane. In order to get through the membrane, you have to prove to me that I can trust you. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Mm. What are situations, maybe you can tell, maybe you can talk about a specific instance, but what are, maybe you can think of a moment or um, an event that happened on Twitter where you were really grateful for this level of secrecy. <laughs> Um, I mean, I tend to be pretty well behaved on Twitter anyway, so I have not like shot off my mouth and attracted a hate mob. Uh -huh. Um, what I do sometimes find myself doing is sort of the opposite of that, where if I'm in a bad mood, I'll like be a pest. <laughs> uh -huh. I'll be a kind of cantankerous reply guy for a few days. And <laughs> I see myself doing it and say, you know what? I, I'm glad that I come across as this sort of mask wearing shit poster where it makes it easy for people to not take me too seriously and not like form a permanent association with my, with my more candid identity about it. So it protects me from myself. Ah, interesting. Can you say more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that the secret to unlocking the power of Twitter is to understand that everyone is performing there are social masks that everyone is wearing, including real name accounts with blue checks. Mm -hmm. um, Probably especially them. Especially them. Yeah. And what I found that I could do for myself was to put on a mask so I could really be myself. Mm. That the level of guardedness I felt when I was contemplating using a real name account with my face instead of a semi-anonymous account with a cartoon avatar. It's the Cheshire cat, if you're wondering. Um, is that I, I didn't have to censor myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, could, I could actually speak my mind and say what I wanted and use that as an opportunity to be attractive to the people I wanted to attract. Mm. And that's another thing that I really want to emphasize about about using any social media platform, but especially Twitter, because Twitter is less structured and more algorithmically influenced than a lot of platforms are. Um, in order to find your people, you need to be attractive to the people that you are attracted to. This mm -hmm. is good advice for dating too. Yeah. Because you can't be attractive to any everyone. If you try, you end up fake. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, but also you have to be comfortable doing it because there's nothing less attractive than being uncomfortable. Yeah. It's the, um, anytime you make a commitment, whether it's like with a, a bold aesthetic look or, um, expressing a belief, um, courageously you, by doing that, you are negating other things. Right. And, and that process of negation is uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a kind of possibility space that we all inhabit. And one of the things that I have sometimes wondered about my Twitter presence is whether people think that I have secret alts or not. I'm not going to answer that question right now. Mm. 
But I do wonder because I have enough of a consistent presence on, on the account that people know me from that there are some things that I might want to talk about and I don't because they're sort of off brand. Mm. Um, so what do you think, Colin? Mm. What do I think about what? If you have secret so, alts? Well, yeah, sure. You can take a stab at that, though. I'm not going to answer it. Uh-huh. But like, like, how important is it to stay on brand? How important is it to stay on brand? I mean, that's a, good, that's a really great question. Um, I think, I, and, and I'll just put a caveat out front, which is, what the fuck do I know? Right. <laughs> but I think um, it, it behooves you to, to be on brand enough at the, on the front end to attract these people that you're attracted to. Mm-hmm. So you have people that see you in a certain way, right? Um, and then the experimenting with being off brand, if you have people that already see you, there might be this kind of like semi-permeable permeable membrane of, of people willing to see you in a, in a different way mm-hmm. because there's a level of like um, trust or coherence that's already been established. Yeah. But it is risky. It's risky. I like that though. That's, that's a good theory. I wonder how you would test it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> my, my joke for this podcast was the brand of this podcast is figuring out the brand of this podcast. Yeah. Just meta at all times. Yeah. Yeah. From the outset, just like this is going to be an exploratory process oriented project. And the moment I feel like I'm in a box, it's uh, uh, something has been lost. Right. That's a failure. Yes. Yeah. So constantly trying new things. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. That sounds cool. Can we pause? I need to use the bathroom. Yeah, of course. While I was peeing, I thought of something I wanted to talk about. Cool. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Jojo Rabbit. Oh, my God. Jesus. Okay, so Colin and I were hanging out last night and we watched Jojo Rabbit, which for those of you who haven't seen it, is a movie about a 10-year-old boy in 1945 in the last days of the Third Reich in Germany. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did not expect to be hit as hard by that movie as I was. Mm-hmm. I was openly bawling in the last scene of the movie. Mm-hmm. It was very powerful. What did you specifically want to talk about with it? Um, I, we didn't really, I think there was like kind of this energy in the room after the movie ended where I think everyone was just kind of processing the movie in their own way. Yeah. And, um, no one was really wanting to like dive into what came up for them or how they were feeling or anything. Like that was just the energy of the room that I felt. Yeah. So it was, it I'm, was heavy. It was heavy. Yeah. So I, I guess I just sort of want to process the experience with you. Like what, like what were some, um, it could be like a movie review slash like we can double click on certain themes that the movie explores yeah okay so let me loop this back around to dharma practice because this is on theme for the interview here um one of the things that is crucial is to understand the causes and conditions of your mind and one of the things that i found so powerful about this movie was the way it put into stark relief the helplessness of a child in this environment and the ways that his mind was conditioned to accept monstrosity as goodness. Um, For example, Mm -hmm. he had an internalized representation of Adolf Hitler, who was an imaginary childhood friend, who was actually quite beneficial to him in most respects. He was very encouraging and helped him get through moments of self-doubt and and fear and Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Yeah, be the rabbit. Right. That was huge. Right. So the reason, this is the first scene of the movie, so very mild spoiler alert. Um, The reason the movie is called Jojo Rabbit is because at the opening sequence of the movie, Jojo goes to Hitler Youth Training Camp where they're basically training child soldiers, which is pretty bleak, and an older boy hands him a bunny rabbit and says, kill the rabbit because you have to be a killer. We're training you to be killers. So kill this rabbit. And he looks at the rabbit and he can't do it. And he runs away and they make fun of him very viciously. And then his imaginary Hitler friend says, no, that was good. Actually, you followed your heart. You're not a killer. 
you freed the rabbit. That's the kind of person you are. Mm-hmm. Be the rabbit, free the rabbit. Mm-hmm. And those words coming out of the mouth of this sort of cartoony version of Adolf Hitler, right? <laughs> this is this is extraordinary. Yeah. So like, here's the backdrop. There's an inner self that Jojo has that does have morality and goodness. Yeah. And the whole thing is dressed up in the clothing of Nazi Germany. Yes. And I think that we all need to have this sort of realization that our minds are populated by mental furniture, images that come from the society we're embedded within. Uh And it's just costume. You can take the costume off of all of that and find what's underneath it. And you have to. You have to. That's where you'll find your goodness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I mean, the the casting was so brilliant, but yeah, the 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 woman who plays the the Jewish girl who's hiding. Yeah, I particularly enjoyed her. Yeah, there was something that was like, uh, um, I don't know, just her like uh, her confidence and the way that she went toe to toe with with the kid and <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing that struck me the most about her character was she was simultaneously the most courageous a person can actually be, you know, facing the destruction of your entire world and death and horror every single day. And then also she was a terrified teenage girl. Mm -hmm. And the actress was marvelous. She portrayed both of that at the same time with no loss of subtlety or power in any of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the acting was fantastic. Um, I think that's another thing that really should be pointed at. Um, Courage comes from vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't consider yourself courageous if you were always going to succeed, if there was no doubt. You have to understand just how much danger you're in. Mm -hmm. And it might not be the mortal danger of, you know, the Gestapo are going to find me and kill me in a camp. It it could just be the the fear of, I'm going to make a fool of myself and my friends won't like me as much. Mm -hmm. But that is a legit fear and it should not be downplayed just because it's not the worst possible thing that can happen. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm afraid I'm, I'm afraid that I might not be able to make rent this month or, right. you know, I'm afraid that my parents will disapprove of my life choices or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it requires that courageous vulnerability to ask for help too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I think so many people don't do when they really need to. That actually people are very compassionate and want to be good. And they're not given opportunities to do it. All of the opportunities that show up in their lives are a way to advance themselves. Say, you do this for this corporation. We pay you money. Like, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. But how many times has someone come to you and said, I'm really hurting. I need a place to stay. Can you put me up for a week and help me find a new apartment? Like, people go through that all the time. And how many people do you know who ended up in a really shitty situation with terrible roommates because they were afraid to ask their social network to help them with that. Right. I've seen that many times, especially in New York because housing is so difficult there. Yeah. Right. So please ask for help. Yeah. I, I like the, I, I want to like further tease out this reframe, like not, not asking for help is actually doing both yourself and others a disservice because you're not yeah. giving them an opportunity to exercise their compassion right that's right yeah and it's cowardly you're running away from your fear of failure or shame or whatever Mm -hmm. it it requires courage to ask Mm -hmm. let's talk more about men and masculinity sure i'm just thinking of of uh just the pernicious social conditioning that can sometimes happen with boys and men of, of thinking that asking for help or thinking that showing weakness or vulnerability is uh is to be avoided how do we grow up more like pro-social boys? Yeah, right. Yeah, so let me share a, a painful moment from early in my childhood. Mm. When I was a kid, I went to summer camp. And one year, my parents sent me to a summer camp that was very, very boyish. Um, it was gender segregated. So there's a girls camp and a boys camp. Mm. 
and the boys camp was very very into competitive team sports and we were little kids too i'm talking like six or seven years old so like this is this is too young to have actually like played at a varsity level or something it's just this is just the culture of the camp it's a really bad fit for me and i don't understand why my parents sent me there um one one of the things that happened was we had a few days ago before the incident gone to see this movie called a league of their own i'm dating myself now in case you're wondering this is this movie came out in like 1993 or something is it tom hanks yeah Uh he's in that movie um and there's a scene in the movie where he is coaching his all women's baseball team the movie takes place during world war ii and all of the men have gone to fight the war and the women at home are playing baseball to you know provide entertainment because there was no major league baseball and and whatever um Tom Hanks is their coach because he's a dysfunctional alcoholic and wasn't accepted by the army. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he's a mean bastard. This is the character. So there's the context for it. But as a, as a six year old, I don't think I really understood that context. Well, he didn't seem like a drunk loser, mean bastard to me. He just seemed like a sort of stand in for a father figure, even though he's a really bad father figure. And, um, one of the women on this baseball team, um, does a feet first slide into third base and they had them in these really impractical uniforms. They're like mini skirts with no stockings. So she scraped up her legs doing it and it really hurts. And she starts crying because it's painful. And Tom Hanks or whatever his character's name is, the coach comes over and he says, what are you crying? There's no crying in baseball and just mocks her and humiliates her. And when I've rewatched the scene as an adult with adult eyes, I see the subtlety in it. It was actually set up to show that Tom Hanks was an asshole and she received the emotional support from her teammates, the other women that treated her the way she needed to be treated with empathy and compassion. Um, But as a child, I didn't see that nuance and the camp counselor that, so that took us to the movie was a great example of a sort of toxic masculine figure. He didn't see the nuance either. He was very sympathetic to Tom Hanks. And he decided after coming back from that movie that he, it would be really funny to yell at a six year old boy who was having trouble playing baseball saying, what are you crying? There's no crying in baseball. I was a very emotional child. Mm. So I think something very similar happened. I, I have this memory of running through the outfield, trying to, trying to chase after a pop fly ball and it was wet, slippery grass and I slipped and I face planted and I started crying, not because I was hurt, but because I was shocked and kind of embarrassed. And I got yelled at for it by this asshole of a camp counselor who was imitating this asshole of a coach in the movie. And it's just an example or many incidents like that throughout my life. And my life is not unique. This is actually fairly typical. Um, I wanted to bring up the story because it shows that even relatively well-intentioned media can be subverted by this unreconstructed toxic masculinity where Mm. what's latched onto as the interesting and fun part is the cruelty, the infliction of emotional suffering on others and the dominance behavior. Mm -hmm. And even though the movie did actually try to portray that negatively, the cultural context that I was living in while this happened to me, was not capable of parsing that. Mm. And so the message that was delivered to me was, fuck you, Dan, you're a loser, you're weak, and you shouldn't play baseball anymore. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. I never played baseball again. Mm-hmm. Hmm. This is the problem that we're facing in our society right now, that when people experience moments of difficulty and this is not a serious difficulty this is like just being a clumsy kid everyone's a clumsy kid Mm -hmm. that instead of like holding people through their moments of difficulty picking them up saying that's okay try again we ridicule them and make them feel bad because they didn't do what we wanted them to do Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's just dominance behavior that that, that's where the toxicity comes from is the attempts at domination Mm mm-hmm yeah, there's like the like the healthy masculine or healthy feminine uh, 
or the health like the healthy mother healthy father mm -hmm. archetype sure and the that energy that holds that holds you when you're when you've fallen down and gives you this unconditional love this is the more sort of magical energy um the healthy the healthy masculine or the healthy father feels like a little bit more difficult to parse out just because I, I don't know. I mean, this is me just speaking from my own experience. Like I just don't know that there are that many examples of it being expressed in, yeah. in a, in a healthy way. Right. they are few and far between. Yeah. And it's like, actually I've got, I've got a hypothesis. Let me, let's see if we can test this. Um, spending no more than 10 seconds to think of examples list off um, the first you know, first several examples of healthy masculinity that you can think of. Mm. Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch. Sure. Mufasa, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mufasa and Atticus Finch, that's it. <laughs> and those are both fictional characters. <laughs> you think of any real people? Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I do have one person in mind, but his energy is very specific. It's a very specific archetype. That's fine. Who is it? Uh, Alexander Bard. I'm not familiar. Mm. Yeah, he's a Swedish philosopher who is kind of embodies like a crazy wisdom archetype. Okay. Cool. But he does a lot of uh, really amazing men's work in Europe primarily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is not a very well-known figure. Um, I think he's he's well known in Sweden. He he is he actually is the, um, he he is on like the Swedish version of American Idol. I forget what the show is called, but he's like the Simon Cowell figure on that show. Okay, so he's like he's, he's a, like he's a, a Swedish celebrity. He's a mid tier Euro celebrity. Yes, got it. <laughs> yeah, cool. The one I was thinking of was Fred Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But it's very hard to think of examples. Yeah, what is it about Fred Rogers that makes him so special? We could talk for a whole hour about just that. Um, let me try to be concise. He emphasized very heavily two different things that I find to be male aspects of compassion. One is a style of nurturing a child by playing to their imagination. Mm. This is different than what I would describe as a more archetypally female style, which is by supporting them physically. That's what a mother does. Mm. A father supports them mentally. Mm -hmm. And Fred Rogers played with puppets and had the world of imagination. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing was this basically unconditional love of his neighbors. The only thing that was necessary for Fred Rogers to love you is that you lived in his community. Mm -hmm. If you were his neighbor, he loved you. And I think that that's a, that's less gendered, but I think that the male expression of that is important because, especially because of, you know, the historical asymmetries in our society where men are far more likely to be in leadership roles, to be owners of businesses or householders, that they become more sort of structural pillars in neighborhoods and communities, just by virtue of, you know, the kind of legacy of the the male dominated culture where they're just more likely to own stuff. Um, that comes with it, a certain responsibility. If you are going to be owning spaces, then you have to set the tone for those spaces. Mm -hmm. And the right tone to set is being a good neighbor, that this place is open for everyone. If you come here with love in your heart, you will be loved. Mm. Mm -hmm. And those are the, the two expressions that Fred Rogers perfected. And I think that is worthy of emulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I mean, there've been a couple, there've been a couple of Mr. Rogers. Uh, there's that movie that just came out and then there was a documentary that came out, I think. Right. A the couple years the ago. movie that just came out was also starring Tom Hanks. So we get to see Tom <laughs> Hanks on both sides of the, yeah, the coin exactly. here. Tom Hanks is a toxic male and Tom Hanks is a, what's the opposite of toxic? A healthy, integrated male? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I haven't seen I haven't seen either of them just because um, a couple years ago in a trailer for that documentary uh, popped I was in I was at the Alamo Draft House in Brooklyn watching some movie and 
and the um, that trailer came on, and I just started openly sobbing in, in the theater. Just like so much emotion came up just by watching this trailer. Yeah. And um, and uh, I think part of me hasn't watched, decided to sit down and watch that documentary because I'm I think I'm afraid of all the emotion that will <laughs> come out. <laughs> watch it. Do it. <laughs> did you see it? Yeah, it's good. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> And it did a good job of humanizing him too, because it's yeah. too easy to put him on a pedestal and say, this man is a saint. This man is a bodhisattva. Or what are... No, he was a guy. He was a man. Yeah. He didn't do anything that the rest of us aren't capable of doing. Uh huh. Yeah. What, what's, what are some of his like more human moments? Um, I mean, I think that he had a lot of complex family dynamics that were not that easy to deal with. Uh huh. I think that, it was easier for him to play this role of nurturing man to other people than it was to his own sons. Uh, yeah. 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 That's kind of like the Martin Luther King dynamic too. Right. Problematic interpersonal, difficult marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Though I think in the case of Fred Rogers, he had a great marriage. His wife was very good match for him. This is with his, his boys that he had trouble with. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. I'm feeling pretty complete with this, with this conversation. Is there anything else that is, top of mind or anything else that you want to explore i'm happy to keep going but uh yeah that seems like a pretty good stopping point okay yeah cool um i'll put your uh i'll you know share your twitter information and but is there anything else that you want to plug like any any upcoming projects or writing or just anything that that you're interested in in talking about at the end here it's all too subterranean right now okay so no okay cool well, I'm excited for it to become more Turanian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, watch this space. There will be stuff coming up. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. It's been a pleasure, Dan. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers.